<coughs> okay, so as I was saying, I'll speak, I'll just cover again quickly how the basic algorithm works. So the idea is we're going to grow a forest of trees, and we're, which means basically we're going to have this collection, an ensemble of trees, and we're going to grow them each completely independently. So there's no interaction between the trees. One tree doesn't influence another, or anything like that. So really, all you have to think about is like, how do I grow one tree? And then you just do that. I guess on this slide, you do it b times. Um, so the first step is to draw a bootstrap sample of your data which means you take like your data set of n points and you sample from it with replacement. And so you can, you, so usually you sample n points, um, you, can, you can sample less, or I guess you could oversample if you want, that starts to get dangerous. Um, but basically this just is an additional source of randomness in addition to what is actually in the node optimization procedure as well. So based it encourages the trees to, to be different from each other, which, if you remember, is sort of one of the keys of random, one of the key strengths of random forests. You want to have many trees, and you want them all to be reasonably good predictors, but you want them to make different mistakes, so that when you average them and take like a majority vote, you end up with um, getting the right answer more often than you would from any of the individual trees. Um, so to grow the tree, it's a recursive procedure. The tree, you start at the root and you grow this binary tree by splitting the, by starting with the root node and you split the root node into two children, and then you recurse into two children. You always take the node and you split into two, and you do that until you meet some stopping criteria, like there's too few data in the leaf to split, or you can't find a good split point, or the tree has reached a max depth that you've set beforehand, or something like that. So there's, there's some sort of criteria for when you actually stop the growing procedure. And so then, so what the real core of what happens in random forest is what happens in the optimization in the leaf, and how you, or sorry, in the node, and how do you choose where to split. And so the way that works is you have, so you have this big data set, you have lots and lots of features, in this case you have p variables, and what you're going to do is you're going to select m of them, typically m will be um, significantly smaller than p, so you get a big reduction in computation by doing this, and you select them just uniformly at random from the available features, and then you optimize along each of those dimensions. And so we're, so this is what I'm describing, you're doing axis aligned splits, which is generally the same in this case. You just pick one dimension, you choose a threshold along that. Um, and the way you optimize along that is you essentially just look at every possible threshold that takes, that creates a different split along that dimension, and you evaluate the information gain you get by partitioning the data in the node Along, that, along the dimension you're looking at, at the threshold you're looking at, you get two children, and so you, then you can compute the information gain you get by making that split, and you choose the one that gives you the best information gain. So this won't necessarily be, of course, the best information gain you could possibly get if you looked at all the variables, but this is one of the things that will average, this is one of the things that sort of decorrelates the trees, is that you choose different variables in each of these. And so at the end, of this fitting procedure, what you output is this ensemble of trees. So you have, here you have B trees, and each of them makes a prediction. And then when you want to predict um, the value for a new data point, you, have, you evaluate, you pass it down each tree, each tree makes a prediction, and then you take a majority vote over the trees, or you average them and you look at the max. Um, so that's I guess a summary of like random forest at that level, that's what, oh, whoops, that was way too far. Um, so that's what you talked about last time. And so what today I'm going to talk about is how to do, um, like what type of features you, you, you would use for um, a real application. So I'm going to talk about first this one. Um, for face detection, which is um, by Viola and Jones. It's a fairly famous paper in computer vision from 2001. 
Um, they actually use boosting in this paper, but what I'm, I'm going to describe is sort of the same thing they did, but with random forests, and it's, it's almost the same. Um, so, the, I guess the question, the, the key thing about this paper is they, they chose really good features for this task. Um, and so the way, you just, the way they designed features was to take, um, you've got this image of a face, and, yeah, so what you, sorry, what is it? Okay, we're so we're detecting faces, so we're actually going to be, we're actually going to have a big image at test time with people in it, and we want to find where the faces are. So this is, what this is showing is training data, so you have a whole bunch of like, well, sort of well-cropped pictures of actual faces, but when, when you test this, what you're going to do is essentially classify sort of every pixel in like a big image, and some of them are going to be faces and some of them are not. From those classifications, you're going to be able to tell well, there's a face here, but there's no face here. Um, but and, but what you're going to be do to, what you're going to do to do that classification is you're just going to look at every little window in the image. So the, class, the task is essentially to classify each to classify these little square windows as face or non face. Um, so. The way they do this is they design these sort these features, which sort of at first look kind of silly, but they end up working very well because you have lots and lots of them. Um, and so you can sort of see in the top row there, sort of shows what's happening. So the the, the outer square there is just the bounding box of the little rectangle you're classifying, and then what you're going to do is you're going to take there's a little black box and a little white box. And what you're going to do is you're going to average the intensity values of pixels in the black box. You're going to average the intensity values of pixels in the white box. And then you're going to subtract the black box from the white box. And that's going to give you a number. Um, and then, so that's, and that's one feature. So each of these little boxes defines a single feature. And you can imagine there's many, many boxes you can have here that have like ones where you've got two black regions on either side of a white one, ones where there's the split is horizontal, ones where the split is vertical. There's many, many of these um, potential features, and they can be sort of, and each one can be at sort of any location in the image. And so, yeah, so essentially you have to, so the and so each of those is like one dimension in this, um, like your key dimensional from fitting the algorithm. So you have many, many of these, and you don't want to evaluate all of them, because there's actually quite a lot, because these can be sort of any size as well. So the way random forests helps here is you pick them at random. So you, like in the algorithm I described, you essentially take, say, a, a thousand of these, or a hundred of these at each node, completely at random. And then you do the partitioning based on those. So, so you don't have to do this computation of all the features in every node, but you select some subset. And that um, saves you, that'll save you quite a bit of time when fitting one of them. Fit, sort of. One of the nice things you can do with random forests is you can deal with these very, very large feature spaces, like this one, that are even implicitly defined. So you never actually will compute the value of every feature for one particular little square. That would be a very, this very long vector of numbers. But you're never going to compute that whole vector explicitly, even though that's the feature space you're working in. What you're going to do is you're going to pick little um, things like that, and you're going to just compute the values for the ones you need. And so one of the reasons these features are nice, in addition to the fact that they actually work, is that you can compute these very, very quickly. Um, by using a trick called the integral image, which if any of you have taken the vision class, you probably know about. It's, you just, um, so, oh, I do have a marker here. So the basic idea for computing these things is what you're gonna do, I'll draw it in one dimension, um, because it's basically the same. Is you've got sort of this one, you've got this function that sort of goes like this or something, and what you compute is um, the integral sort of from here to wherever, and that, so that sort of goes. 
this, and this is, and so what you end up doing is if you want to compute sort of the area here, so if you want to sum up all these pix all the pixels in this area, you look at this function, you compute the difference between here and here. And so for each of these images, you do a pre-processing step where you do like a cumulative sum along two of the dimensions, and you get something that's not very interesting to look at, but it means you can compute um, the sum of all the pixels in a rectangle by looking at just four numbers instead of looking at um, the whole thing. So these features are very, very fast to compute, which is one of the motivations for looking at them, because there are lots of them. So you want, if you want to be able to try like 100 in each node, then you want to be able to compute them very, very quickly. And so yeah, I think that's so I have this H. So the, the equation there is the H is this feature you've chosen this this particular rectangle and you've evaluated. And so the F is this rectangle, and you just look at you're looking at the difference and you're thresholding the difference between these two particular regions of the image. Um, and so here's you know Nando's slide about examples. You can do, Use this for face detection. Um, you can detect cats if you'd like. It's also um, <clears throat> detecting cars and things like also pedestrians is a very useful thing you can do with this, like for things like Google's car, where it's got to be able to identify other cars on the road and not hit them. Or just like here, we've got sort of looks like monitoring some sort of tunnel. You can use that. Um, to monitor like traffic flows within a city, so you can look at where the congestion is and where um, better routes need to be planned. And the hockey thing, where you tra where they're trying hockey players, is actually something that is a project that's been going on at UBC for quite a while in the Vision Group, where they sort of do all kinds of things, where they track like hockey players and basketball players, and sort of project, figure out from videos of these games, like where are the players on the court or on the ice. And look at like how they're moving around, so you can get a sort of high-level view of what's happening in the game. And this is sort of very useful for like coaching stuff, and understanding how the team is behaving during a game. Um, yeah. So one of the um, not, so this is a new, different application. This is one of the I guess it's a high-profile application, although the random forest aspect is perhaps not played up all that much, but um, Microsoft, I'm sure you all know what the Kinect is, but in case anybody doesn't, it's a thing that like hooks up to your Xbox and it's got this camera that sort of watches your living room and you get up and you sort of wave at your television, jump around and you can control video games that way instead of sitting on your couch and pressing buttons. Um, so the way that so the way the Kinect sensor works is it's, like I said, it's this device that sits like on your television and it's got a sensor that looks out at your living room and what that sensor looks for is depth. So it measures, it projects like lots and lots of, um, I think they're infrared rays out and measures the depth or measures how far they travel before they bounce back. And so what the image you get or the raw data you get from a Kinect is um, this sort of grayscale image where dark things are close to you and light things are further away. I can never remember <coughs> which way they do it. Looks like dark is closer to you. So you can think of the volume of the pixel is directly proportional to actually the distance that the ray traveled. Um, and so what you and you end up with these like things on the left where it's just sort of this amorphous sort of person-shaped blob, um, it's, and so it's easy to segment the background out of this, because the background is generally far away, so it's just sort of, that, that's sort of an easy problem. But what's more difficult is figuring out, like, what is this person doing? And they're going to be, like, leaping around and waving their arms. And, like, you have to be able to, to, in order to use that as a control mechanism, you have to be able to figure out, like, what, essentially what they're doing. So, <laughs> The ultimate goal is to get um, sort of a model of the skeleton of the person. So you have, you figure out where their joints are in 3D space and what angles they're at. And then you've got a pretty good idea of 
um, the pose the person is taking. Um, but you have to get there from just these sort of raw depth images where you've gotten, where you've subtracted the background. And so um, the, the place where the connect comes into this is in this first step, which is first you sub segment the depth image into um, body parts. You want to say, well, like the, the, this block of pixels here corresponds to the left shoulder. This is the head, these are the hands, left and right hands. And uh, Microsoft has a fairly fine-grained taxonomy of body parts that they identify because, I mean, you have to be able to identify quite a, quite a variety of poses you need to be able to have. You need to be, and that, it's easier to do that if you can identify, like, the, if you can separate, like, the top of the leg from the bottom of the leg. Um, like that. So, they, so they use um, the connector, <laughs> and I think this is one of the sort of Motivating examples for why Microsoft has done so much work on the connect, or sorry, on the on random forests in recent years is they used it in the connect and it was quite successful. So I'm going to tell you, I guess, a bit about how they do this first step. I'm not going to talk about this second one where you go from body parts to um, joint positions, but I'll talk about the first one where you go from a depth image of a person to um, segmented body parts using random. So the first, the first problem here is you need to get training data for this. And um, what they do is kind of neat, because this is the one, one of the very few scenarios where this actually works in real life, is they generate synthetic data. Um, and so usually you can't do this. It, like trying to generate synthetic data of real things is surprisingly difficult, of realistic looking things is surprisingly difficult. But um, if you look at like, what you're working with, it's just this depth image. It's just sort of this silhouette, and um, there's not much detail there at all. So you don't need a particularly detailed model of a person to be able to produce these synthetic depth images. Like, you don't have to worry about things like uh, the texture of their face, or like what color shirt they're wearing, or that it looks like a shirt. Because all you can see is, all the, all the sensor can see is how far away things are. Um, so, what they can do to generate data and to generate lots of data is they have this parameterized model of a person. Um, and it's parameterized in, in sort of all sorts of dimensions, like how tall the person is, sort of how stocky they are. Um, like they've got male and female models and sort of like all sorts of variations of body shapes. Because of course, this has to work for everybody. Right? So you can't just pick a few people and fit them. This, they're going to sell this to the consumer market, and people are not going to be happy if like, they're too short or their kids are too short to be recognized by the connectors. Um, so, they, they can, so they actually use the computer to generate this data. Another reason they need to do this is people will go into like, bizarre poses, and you're never going to be able to get someone like in front of these sensors and tell them, like, do all the weird things you think someone might do in their living room. Um, like while waving at their television. You'll never get them all. People do really bizarre things. So anyway, with this model that can generate this whole like, wide, um, pretty wide range of um, pretty wide range of poses, and then they generate synthetic depth images like I showed you on the previous slide, and that's what they can use um, to actually train the model they use in the system. Um, so once you've got these synthetic images. Um, so once you've got these synthetic images, the question is like, what features do you use to actually classify? And so the features they use are sort of similar in <coughs> similar in spirit to the Viola Jones features, but a bit but a bit different. Is again the task is the same. You've got this image here to classify every pixel in this image, like. This is a head pixel, this is a left arm pixel, this is like a right hand pixel. And you're going to use the same model to do all of that, and you're going to use, and to classify an individual pixel, you're going to use a window around it, um, which gives you some context, some context to what is around this pixel to be able to, use, to, be able to figure out what's in it. Um, and so here, I guess I can just draw this one. Um, 
So they use actually um, features that are even simpler than the VL of Jones. They just, they've got, um, um, you've got this window um, around this pixel in the center. And this, this pixel in the center is the one you're classifying. And you've picked some like, window size around it that you're willing to look at. And then what they do is they pick two offsets in this window. So they pick essentially two random vectors, like say this one and this one. And you look at the pixels at the end of those vectors. And so this is one feature of what I'm describing. So you've got this pixel here, and this pixel here, and let's say this is u, and this is v. I'll tell you what the normalization there is in a minute. Just ignore the divided by dx thing. So you've got this is x. This is the pixel you're classifying. Um, that d is the depth function. So you look at the depth of x plus u. So you look at this pixel, and you look at the depth of x plus v. So you look at this pixel and you subtract the depth here from the depth here. And so that's, I mean, that's very similar to what Viola Jones did, but they had like windows like this, and then they put them somewhere in the image. Here we're just going to choose two random offsets and just look at two pixels. Um, and so I believe the way they choose these is they'll actually generate these from a Gaussian distribution. Um, so like the, and so you have a 2D Gaussian that's round, and you sample two vectors from that to get these offsets. And so you would imagine like things close by are more likely, but you still have a chance of choosing things far away. Um, this is another one of these implicit feature spaces that I mentioned, like Viola Jones are doing. Like, there's a huge number of, of these features, right? It's sort of like number of pixels in this window square, which is just, I'm, well, I mean, it's not intractable. These might be like 32 by 32, so 32 by 32 squared. That's probably not too big. To, that's probably not too big in principle, but that's quite a lot. Of, um, quite a lot of features to, if you were going to generate this all up front. But because of the way, but because of the way you actually do this, you never have to generate the full representation. You just generate several candidates for this, and you just if you calculate that particular feature value, which is defined by u and v. Um, you calculate that as needed to do when you're doing like the fitting in the node and then later when you're doing prediction. You just have one of these. Um, so, the reason for the, um, so the reason for that, the normalization term, the thing that's dividing um, u and v is that um, that makes di that's, that's sort of making distances in the world um, relative to the, relative to the point you're trying to classify, that's making them the same no matter how far the object is from the actual sensor. So if you have like, like if you're in a scenario like this where your sensor is here, what you're, you've got this image plane here that you're looking through, um, and then you've got like some, yeah, some like big stick here in the world, and so you're going to look out at say this, pix this pixel here, and so this is the pixel, and so this is the point it actually corresponds to in the world. This, so, and then this distance is one, um, this distance here is d of x, this is the actual x pixel. And then you're going to look at like an offset from that, so you're going to look at something up here, and then it's actually this distance here that's say <coughs> minus this is going to be the u over x. Um, and so what that's going to do, so what dividing by dx does is essentially move this plane out to here, out to the actual depth of the pixel you're looking at. So that way, like if the sensor's over there and it wants to compare like this pixel and this pixel on the like, if I walk closer, the thing, if I don't do the normalization, the actual points it's looking at get closer together. So, um, that, that's, so, that, so what that normalization term is doing is essentially giving you um, sort of depth invariance in the features. Because things far away will appear smaller in the depth image itself. Um, so right, here is then, we just, 
This is basically what I said, but I'll say it again. This goes through sort of from start to from top to bottom how they fit the trees in the connect is so what they do is actually slightly different than the algorithm I described right at the beginning. When they when they sample, so in the, the algorithm I described at the beginning, what you do is you sample features and then you optimize the thresholds using all your data. So what Microsoft actually does is they sample features and thresholds together. So they sample whole split points. Um, and they optimize over that set. Um, why do they do that versus um, optimize over the data? I don't know. It, they, it, it's just like there are many sort of little variants you'll find of the random forests algorithm. And this is sort of one of the differences that we find sometimes. Sometimes people will optimize for part of their node fitting procedure, and sometimes they'll be more random. Um, and I mean, it's not, I don't know that one is sort of better than the other. It's just sort of the way you choose to do it. So anyway, they, so Microsoft samples, like I said, they sample a feature, which, which is a U and a V, and they sample a threshold, which is like a, a threshold on the difference between this depth and this depth. Um, and they use that to split each of the nodes. So at each node, you'll sample many of those splits, and you'll compute the partition that's created of your data in your node into two sets that's created by each of those. And once you've computed the partition for each of them, you compute the information gain. And again, you take the largest information gain over this whole set. And they've got some stopping criteria here. Like, um, you stop when you don't have like, enough information gain. It's possible to sort of get stuck with information gain, where if like, you end up in a leaf that's, say, really big, but is all one class. You're not going to be able to find any useful split point that tells you anything more, because everything in that region belongs to the same class. So in a scenario like that, you won't be able to find a, a split point which gives you like a nice information gain. So that putting a threshold on the minimum gain sort of allows you to stop you get scenarios like that, where you get sort of run into scenarios where none of your splits are telling you so there's no point to uh, continuing to go. Um, so yeah, here's some examples of like this algorithm in action. The stuff on the left is synthetic data, which I don't know which are training and test actually. Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but um, so sort to of get an idea of what these guys are going for. So you've got to segment these people in these very strange poses. Um, and then the stuff on the right is actual test data of real people. So they, so they do do, of course, some testing on actual depth images of people. They don't only use the synthetic data. But what they use the synthetic data for is augmenting the um, amount of real data they have. So you can get a so they can get a wider variety of a wider variety of training and testing, basically. But I mean, you sort of see it, it does pretty well. Um, and so there's sort of other applications you can use <coughs> the same idea for. Where um, here I don't actually know what the, these guys are doing in particular. But um, <coughs> instead of segmenting the body now with yeah. um, So they are not using any prior information, like the normal kind of, uh, structure, the, the left hand on the left, the right hand on the right. So no, no perimeter information at all. No, no information of like where, rel where body parts exist relative to each other. Body part is uh, labeled independently. Yeah, actually, each pixel is labeled. <coughs> <Whoops. laughs> um, so yeah, what you see there is you see like they're segment segmented into like colored regions, but actually like each pixel in this image is classified independently, um, and it's using like this sort of thing. So each pixel is, becomes the center of a window, and you run the random forest to get a prediction for it. And that's the dimension for just, so that color is just one pixel in these, in these images. And you do that for every pixel. 
but so yeah, they're not using any like smoothing information where you put like some sort of additional structure on top that knows about like the geometric relationship or anything like that. Like none of that is. Can you use the fact that pixels belonging to the hand should be near other pixels belonging to the hand? Yeah, I mean that's definitely possible, and like a lot of that's done a lot. You, what you do is you use like a, a you use a, a Markov random field for that. Where you have like a grid, and they have connections between latent variables, which are the classes, and then you have connections to actually the measurements, which are your classifier outputs, and the potentials in the hidden field sort of encourage everything to be smoother. So that like you've got a whole bunch of arm pixels like surrounding like one leg pixel. The leg pixel is probably wrong. But as far as I know, the Microsoft Connect stuff doesn't do that. But I mean that's definitely possible, and then that's done quite. So yeah, that, let's just show you. Like I said, I don't actually know what these guys are doing, um, but <coughs> or what, I mean, I don't know what the purpose of this is. What they're doing is pretty clear. Is they're doing a sort of a very fine-grained segmentation of a hand. Um, and so, like Microsoft, I said they use like a, a fairly fine-grained taxonomy of body parts. But of course, you can go much finer. They have like a left and right hand and like pieces of the arm. Where these guys are just interested in getting a very good idea of like what, what an individual hand is doing and where the fingers are and where the individual joints of that are. And I'm, like I said, I'm not entirely sure what they're doing in this chair, but it's just like another application that you can use this same idea for. So this could be done in exactly the same way. That's <coughs> what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I guess that's all I'm going to say about the commandments. So any questions about the connect before I move on to this? Yeah. Uh, not specifically about the connect, but with random forests when they, like choosing between more trees or more branches. Like uh, uh, Nanda was saying that often in practice the tree is just a single feature, like just a single feature. <clears throat> yeah, so like a stump. Yeah, exactly. So how do you choose between the two? What are the trade-offs between stumps and trees? Uh, so what are the trade-offs between stumps and trees? So, um, trees, for a number of trees, um, it's usually more is always better. You're generally limited by how much time you have. Um, yeah, you generally don't make, if you consider like a fixed size for the tree or something, mm -hmm. 10 trees are going to be better than 5 trees, and 100 <coughs> trees are going to be better than 10 trees, pretty much always. Yeah, but um, for a fixed amount of computation, though, where you can have a million trees with, of stumps, like a million stumps, yeah. or a thousand trees with a thousand branches. So that, that ends up being problem dependent. So, for instance, the connect, in the connect example, it works, um, what works well is very few, very deep trees. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I think what they actually use is um, three trees in the end. Mm -hmm. um, part of, and part of that is for computational reasons. It takes longer. They have to do this in real time in the connect. Right? Mm -hmm. So they're very motivated by going quickly. Um, so it, it's actually pretty quick to pass a point through a tree, but if you have to do it a hundred times, that adds up. So what they do is they use, um, I, believe, I believe it's three, I could be wrong about that, but it's a very small number of very deep trees. So that the trees might have like, have, like the longest path in the tree might be 60 um, nodes. It's probably not full, because that would be an enormous tree. But, um, and so yeah, we've seen that as well, trying to, there's some connect data available somewhere. It works, it, you really need to train for the connect in particular, you need to train for deep trees. Um, so. And I guess you use just cross validation to figure that parameter out? Yeah. Whether you want deep trees or shallow trees for the fixed amount of computation. <coughs> so, oh, you're saying like, so you want to know like, fixed amount of computation. Yeah, you, you have to use something like cross validation to figure that out. It's generally going to depend on the problem. And it's not necessarily obvious just like looking at the problem, which is going to be I like I was saying, I know for the connect it works better to have fewer deep trees than to have um, not very many very short trees. People don't often use um, things as short stumps with random forests. They're very popular in Boosting, which is sort of a similar type of algorithm. But um, Boosting has this sort of Boosting is sequential, and what it uses is, very, is some sort of clever reweighting 
of the trees, so you can kind of like a random forest, you just average the trees at the end. They're all completely independent, you train them in parallel, and you average them. So the, the individual classifiers, you do something clever, but the ensemble, you do something very dumb. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another side of this, which is like boosting, which, where you usually do, you're usually less smart about the individual classifiers, so you can, like, a, and there it's very common to use, like, just stumps, just one line. But you do something clever where you fit them in sequence, and you fit one, and you look at like the errors it makes, and then you reweight your data, and then you fit another one, and you look at the errors they make together, and you reweight the data again. You have, and you end up with like a weighted combination of these things that are each trained on weighted combinations of data, and so you get this sort of fancy combination. Um, where, how do you actually draw the line between like do I want to be clever or bad? Know that anybody really has a good answer for other than cross validation. <coughs> All right, so, like, so I guess this is actually the last thing I have to tell you. But, um, so we've talked. And Nanda, so I've talked, and Nanda's talked about doing um, classification with these trees, but they're actually very flexible models. You can do, in addition to classification, you can do regression, which is what I'm going to tell you about now. Um, but if you look at um, the Kriminisi book that Nanda has been telling you about, you'll, you'll see you can not only do classification, you can do regression, you can do clustering, you can do density estimation. Manifold learning. Um, they have this. You can do semi-supervised versions of all of these, um, and so each. But and so each of these sort of layers on its own um, additional bits onto the base algorithm. Usually, in how you decide where to. So there, there's two places that these will change. There's how you decide where to put the split points. Um, so, like, what, what function do you actually use, like, in classification, you use the information gain, but you might change that out for a different function for other tasks. It's actually the same in regression, but um, that's sort of incidental. So the two examples that we're going to show you, you can change that out for other objectives, or there's also what, what models do you put in the leaves. So in classification, you'll talk about, like, fitting a histogram, you just fit a histogram in the Take the majority, you take the highest peak in the history. I mean, for regression, you can do like what this slide is showing you, where you, it's actually fitting a linear model. So, say you, say you actually, in the second thing, if you pick, or sorry, in that first example, if you pick that split point where it's got that question mark there, and then you look at like the data on the left, and you can fit something like this Bayesian linear model. You have a linear function, and you also have, like, at each point, you have a Gaussian, that's basically, a, whose uh, mean and variance are a function of, of x. So you get, <coughs> I'm, I'm sure you guys have talked about, like, actually just fitting these models to data, but you can actually put models like this in the, in the leaves as well. <coughs> I mean, in principle, you can put whatever you want in the leaves. Um, in practice, you maybe worry a little bit about what, what will I have enough data in the leaves to to fit because when you're growing a tree, I mean trees have a lot of leaves. Like a tree of depth D has something like two to the D leaves. So order of, depending on whether or not it's full. But um, so that actually is going to partition your data um, pretty finely. So if you're in high dimensions, for instance, you might not have enough data to really fit a very complicated model. Which is why people use things like um, which is why people use really simple things like histograms or um, some common one for regression is actually just to fit a constant function in the leaves. And then your each tree is sort of this piecewise constant function, depending on how you've divided up your space. And so so I mean, sometimes it's nice to, sometimes it's nice to be able to do these fancy things, but you have to remember that you need you, t you tend to need a lot of data to do something fancy like this. Like, I think there's a paper somewhere where people fit like even Gaussian processes in the in each leaf. You need, you need quite a lot of data to do that. So you can't always get away with it. But, anyway, what I wanted. 
So, so yeah, anyway, I'm sort of getting a little I'm focused here as I wanted to tell you about what you do for the to fit a regression tree. So just uh, basic idea of how you would fit this tree. So I mean in a lot of ways it's exactly the same as you would do in classification. You've got this same tree structure that you have to build, and you're going to build trees independently, and each tree you're going to build by recursively splitting these nodes until you have until you reach some stopping criteria. <coughs> and to split each node, what you're going to do is you're going to sample dimensions, or you're going to you're going to sample dimensions, and you're going to decide. Um, based on optimizing some, some function, you're going to look at all these dimensions and over each of them you're going to optimize um, some gain function and you're going to choose the best. So in that sense it's exactly the same as classification and in this sense it's actually, even in this case in particular, it's actually even more like classification because you're actually going to still optimize an information gain. The difference is what you're going to do before. Before in classification your objective is discrete, so you're going to optimize a discrete information gain. Whereas in this one you're going, in this version you're going to optimize a continuous version of information gain. It looks, it actually looks exactly the same. The only difference is computing the entry. Um, so, like if you remember the information gain, what information gain looks like is you've got, so S, S is your leaf. So, sorry, so this is the information game. S. So this is the entropy of um, whatever is in your leaf, and you're going to subtract um, the <coughs> You're going to subtract this weighted combination. So this SI is um, like either the left or right child that would be created by this slab. Um, so the information game looks like this, where you take like the entropy of the distribution, you look at where you're going to split it, and you subtract the expected entropy after that split. Um, and all the changes to go from classification to regression here is how do you compute this entropy? Um, and so for like what it's, so, and how you compute that entropy is going to depend on what is actually the model you're using in each of So when you're doing the histograms, it's that, you know, you do the sum, <laughs> like P log P. Um, for this example here where you're doing um, this Bayesian linear model, what you have is at each, at each data point you have a, like you look at, like the prediction for each data point, you've got a Gaussian. And so you compute the entropy of that Gaussian. And there's, um, I'm not going to write that down. It's, a, it's an integral instead of a sum, but it's still a P um, So for one, in one dimension, this works out really nicely. You're, you, you're essentially just looking at um, the squared error. And what, so this becomes, or like this whole thing is proportional to this being the squared error of like your linear fit in the node. And this is the squared error of the linear fit in the children. Um, or something pretty close to that. Um, so yeah, you're, you, you can, and so this is this is sort of what I was talking about with you can do different models. Like you, on the left, you can do like these flat ones where you just you just average everything in the leaf. That's very similar to the histogram. <laughs> average um, like one of n predictions to the histogram. You can fit fancier things. I don't think I've ever seen, actually seen someone do what they're doing in the middle, where they have two different models in the leaves. Like they've got what looks like a quadratic on the left and a linear on the right. Um, there's no reason you can't do that. It's just, it, it's sort of hard to know. What, well, if I'm going to be, say, say if I'm going to like give myself like the option of choosing three different models for each leaf. How do you know which one to choose? Do you really gain a lot by fitting a quadratic versus just like splitting it one more time and fitting two linear functions? 
But well, the, interesting, the really interesting case is when you start doing these, um, these Bayesian fits. So you can do like the Bayesian linear models, like I mentioned, where you get confidence intervals. You can also do um, you can also do confidence intervals with the constant version as well, where essentially you're, it's a it's a Bayesian version of the constant model where you fit Gaussian on the y's as well. And those are um, really interesting because, and I think Nando told you about this. Um, last lecture, but the reason those are interesting is you get very interesting confidence, um, you get very interesting, um, I guess, confidence intervals for regions where you don't have data if you go this way. Um, so, like this, and when you think about this, it's like the thing to compare it to is like a Gaussian process, where like Gaussian process will give you. Um, For example, here is you've got something like a bunch of data here and like a bunch of data here, and the Gaussian process will give you something like this, and like there'll be really low uncertainty here, and high here, and low. Um, so like this is the kind of thing you get on this example from the Gaussian process. The point is, like in each of these x values, like I look here, I've got this one Gaussian, and there's one. There's exactly one mode. I've got the mean, and then I've got an interval. Um, but what the forest is giving me is for this, where they're using, um, so in this one, they're using the Bayesian linear models. And there's, so it's easy to, there's two leaves. This, forest. this is a very simple problem, so they are, in fact, using stumps in this one. I mean, very few problems in real life are this. Um, but what you get with the forest, <clears throat> the data over here, you've got the data over here, and you've got these linear fits, and this, I've sort of drawn this too long, I guess, but um, you get, like, it kind of look like this, so that it's an average of things that go out like this, and so these things will be chopped off at various points, so like a decision here, like you might get this part, but what you get, say, if you look right here, is you get this kind of, you have this, this and you, what you have is actually multimodal. So with a Bayesian linear model, you're actually each, the thing you get from the forest when you evaluate at a particular axis is actually a, actually a mixture of Gaussians. So you have like sort of these two modes that you think are interesting, one of which is a continuation of this line, and one of which is a continuation of this line. And since you haven't seen any data, you don't know what's there. Um, but, so that's probably a really interesting property about what you get out of um, confidence and just holes with random forests. You can get these multimodal things. And so something that would be like need to do, which I think Nando mentioned, is Bayesian optimization with these models instead of, <laughs> rather than Gaussian processes, and see if, see if you do in practice actually gain anything by having these sort of more elaborate um, posterior, more elaborate posteriors um, than you get from Gaussian process. Um, question? Yeah. So, so we get these multimodal Gaussians only at the decision at the split point boundary, right? Not in the two regions where we have seen the data. So um, is that too interesting to So yeah, so well I guess two things. One is like your prediction here is still a mixture of Gaussians. Um, you get one Gaussian from every tree. What I'm so what I'm talking about here is doing like in each leaf of the tree, you fit a Bayesian linear model. So at each point, just in one leaf, at each x point, you have a Gaussian. And so now you pick a new x, and you put it through the tree, and you get a Gaussian. Then you put it through the next tree, and get another Gaussian. Put it through the next tree, and get another Gaussian. And so the actual prediction of the forest is the average of all those Gaussians. Um, but I mean, the other part of this is you're right. Like in somewhere like here, where you have a lot of dense data that's pretty like, it's pretty clear this part at least is flat. Um, what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with all the Gaussians in the same place, like with overwhelming probability. I mean, nothing really guarantees that. You could have 
bootstrapped and just like not chosen anything here in one of your trees. That's very unlikely to happen. But, um, but for something like Bayesian optimization, what's really interesting is what's happening in the areas you don't know. Because right? you're trying to explore the function, but you're trying to not evaluate it in too many points. So you want, when you know something's going to be bad, you want to actually avoid searching. Um, and so it's the, um, it's the it's these like posterior estimates in regions of the space that you don't know much about that are what are really like, important for driving the exploration. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, like I was saying, I don't know if this is a better way to do it um, than Gaussian processes, but I don't think anybody's done that, at least not with like <coughs> fully Bayesian models. So, I mean, and you do get these different things, so it's possible that like this could have interesting problems. That's all I'm trying to say. I don't know that this is necessarily the best way to do it. Just that there is this interesting phenomenon. Maybe it could be explained. Any questions? I think like that's all I have to say actually for this lecture. So I guess next week you're going to talk about doing optimization and I don't know if we'll talk about neural networks next week. It's like that's what you're doing.